Hello, welcome to this week's Economy. I'm Dr. Vance Ginn, your host. Thank you for joining me again here today. We've got a lot to talk about, so I really just want to jump right into it. Thank you for joining me again, though. And, you know, you can find all the show notes at vancegin.com, or you can sign up for my newsletter at vancegin.substack.com to receive it in your inbox every time there is either a Let People Prosper show that airs, which is every Tuesday, or these this week's economy, the, what I'm doing here, which is every Friday morning. So you get those right in your inbox, so you won't have to wait uh, or look for it anywhere else. I also share this on Twitter, Advanced Gin. So be sure to check that out. I'm also on Instagram and there's a Facebook page as well at Let People Prosper um, and LinkedIn, all the places you can check it out. Um, this coming Tuesday, there will be less Ford. Um, Les is another great person, liberty fighter overall, who looks at safety net reforms. And we talk a lot about safety net reforms, what works, what hasn't worked over time, what states should be doing differently. So please don't, don't miss that one coming up on Tuesday. So with all that said, let me jump right into it today. Um, the, on the markets, um, this is at, on Thursday, June 8, 2023, at about 1224 Central Time. The Dow Jones is up about half percent, the 33,824. The S&P 500 is up about half a percent to 4,287. The NASDAQ is up about a little over three quarters of a percent to 13,205. So we see some uptick there. There's been a lot of discussion about you know, the labor market, which I'm going to get into some here in a minute, but also what the Fed's going to do whenever they meet later this month. Um, and then we have inflation report that's going to come out next Tuesday on the 13th. Those are all going to be things to look at of the health of the economy and what's been going on there. Crude oil futures are down a little bit. They're down to $71.24 per barrel. We had seen them spike a little bit yesterday as OPEC, or really Saudi Arabia, said they were going to cut some of their production. We'll see if that actually happens. They have incentives in place for them to cheat, right, to announce one thing so the prices will go up, but then not continue to not cut their production so they can get more revenue, right? I mean, a lot of their economy uh, is based on oil and gas. A lot of their revenue going to government for all their handouts that they do and other spending comes from oil and gas as well. So they want the price to be as high as possible. So we'll see what happens there. You know, the Biden administration isn't helping at all <laughs> with the amount of oil production and the permits that they're holding up and everything else. It's really a, a sad situation that we should have more oil and gas in the United States um, overall. Gold is at 1979. It's about $20 today. So these are all some key indicators. And finally, the euro, $1.07 per euro. That's some depreciation of the dollar, as we've seen that here recently as well. You know, we did get the debt deal that was done, which wasn't really much of a deal, not much spending restraint, but it helped at least to push off, kick the can down the road a little bit of what's going to happen there. I've got a good piece in the Daily Caller that you should check out. I'll put in the show notes about that there. So some key things happen in the, in the economy overall, the U.S. side of things um, that I'm starting off here with. And, the, and last Friday, which came out after I released this, uh, this week's economy last week, the jobs report was out. And, you know, the headline number, you know, shows that, when you look at the employment report, which looks at non-farm payroll employment increased by 339,000 in May. Remember, it's always the month previous. The unemployment rate, which comes from the household survey, the establishment report comes from businesses, right? Where they call them up and say, how many people have you hired or fired? The household survey comes from individuals. They do a survey calling people up and see if they have a job or not. And so the unemployment rate comes from the household survey, and it actually rose by 0.3 percentage point to 3.7%. So still pretty low over all, uh, but it is something that we want to watch because that could be an indication of something else to come. But I wanted to come back to this non-farm payroll employment number of 390, not 339,000 increase in May, pretty sizable increase. There was also some revisions upward uh, in March and April as well. So you saw the increases in those months it contributed to even more jobs that were being added. And I think what we're going to see is more and more of these changes, the revisions that are going to happen. You know, we have the data that they use for seasonal adjustments based on 20 and 21 data, a um, little bit of 2022. But, you know, it's it's difficult because there was so much volatility that was happening during that period with the shutdowns, with the openings up and everything else that this is a lot of bad data, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And so I think these seasonal adjustments are, 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 are flawed. There's a lot of problems with it. And so we're going to see some of that within these data. And so it's important for us to make sure we're also looking at other indicators of what's going on in the labor market. And that's why I also like to look at the household survey and say, okay, we have 339,000 jobs that was said we're adding the non-farm employment report. What about the employed number coming from the household survey? And that was actually down 300,000 to 160.7 million 
Um, and so 300,000 loss. Now, this is people saying that they don't have a job. Maybe they don't have as many jobs or something else like that. This could also be an indication of the tech sector because this includes those independent contractors that have started in the last couple of years in the household survey, whereas the establishment survey only does established firms, right, that have been in existence more than two years. So a lot of these tech firms, a lot of independent contractors, things of that nature, which came on during, you know, the recession and working from home and everything else that have happened um, since the pandemic, you know, maybe many of them are the first ones to go, which makes sense, right? Interest rates going up, inflation going up. They couldn't, um, they couldn't make it for a while. Maybe they lost their, their, their business, those contracts. And so they lose some of their jobs first. We've also seen the tech industry being hit hard over the last you know, year. I think they've come back a little bit now, but there was a big hit there. And so that may take some time for those jobs to start to be lost as well. And so I think that's something we'll want to watch. And that's what contributed to the increase in the unemployment rate from 3.4% to 3.7%. The labor force participation rate did go up by about, or the labor force increased by about 150,000. The labor force participation rate, though, um, stayed flat because population, the non-institutional population also increased by about that amount. The unemployed is back up to 6.1 million. That's the highest in more than a year. So that's something else for us also to watch. And the other thing is, is that we have seen an increase in the, 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 the rate of growth of the um, private sector wages or average hourly earnings or average weekly earnings, however you want to look at it, um, they are up over the last year by about a little over 4%. But the problem is, is that inflation is up over also up over 4%, right? And so this is where we've been talking about how, you know, year over year in inflation adjusted terms, average weekly earnings or average hourly earnings are down for more than two years. I think it's at 25 months now. And so this is not a good sign for the overall labor market. So we've got some things we want to watch. Um, the employment to population ratio for the 25 to 54 year olds, the prime age, you know, it's back above where it was before the pandemic, actually going back to even 2008, you've got to go back all the way to 2000, 2001 before you see it higher than where it is today. So that's a good sign that some people are getting back in the workforce and everything else. So that's something we want to watch. Um, so that's the national news. On the state side of things, you know, there's been um, and one other thing I wanted to mention about that. The In 2025, um, Brian Riedel put out this point about how the debt limit's going to expire, expiring discretionary spending caps, expiring tax cuts, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, right? Especially on the, the individual side, expiring health provisions and a new presidential term. It's a great opportunity, is what I tweeted out here recently in 2025, for sound fiscal policy, including a spending limit, tax reforms, and other pro-growth changes. So there's a good opportunity there, even as there are challenges that look ahead. Speaking of challenges and what's happening in the states, Texas has had a challenge. You know, During the legislative session, I've been kind of critical of how much they spent, the largest spending increase in Texas history, the largest increase in welfare in Texas history, massive amounts there, and, and, and no tax relief so far. We have this special session, though, now that's being discussed, the first call special session, discussion between what's happening in the House of Compression, which just means reducing the tax rates by 16.2 cents per $100 valuation of property. Um, and, and, and that's really the pathway to elimination, right? And then you have the Senate, which is saying, look, we want 10 cent compression and we want an increase in the homestead exemption by 60000 to $100,000. And, and that's not the way to uh, elimination. And also it's not broad based. If you're just doing homesteaders, that's not the entire market. And I was looking here recently and I have a post about this that I'll put in the show notes, the overview of property tax relief proposals in Texas on my website, vanskin.com, where I go through each one of their proposals. Um, but also note that Governor Greg Abbott has said that it, this is my plan which is a TPPF roadmap that I've been working on for years. I put links up to the first co-authored paper that I wrote on this back in 2018, uh, but another big paper in 2021 that looked at different methods and how this could eliminate property taxes within about a decade with just spending restraint and using surplus dollars to buy down those school M&O property taxes. So this doesn't actually change any of the spending on education based on the state's determined school finance formulas. It just changed the method, the tax that's paying for it. Instead of property taxes, it's mainly going to come from sales taxes which are more efficient, allow people to own more of their own home and things of that nature. And it works on with the ability of people to pay based on market conditions, not based on the whims of an appraisal district and the elected tax taxing entities, um, th those folks. So I think this is a good measure there. Um, I put some other information in there. I also had about the frozen Texas budget, path to eliminating property taxes, spending restraint can get this done much faster, maybe even in three or four years. Um, talked about uh, uh, two professors at a Rice universities did a study in 2018 
2019, showing the economic benefits of this. So there's just a lot of benefits to this. And then I go through a couple of scenarios in Austin, Dallas, and Houston of what it would look like. So there's a lot of talk about raising the homestead exemption. And I've been very adamant to say, look, this will not get us to zero. It, it won't even really control the growth rate of your property taxes because once it, your appraisal goes up by more than $60,000, you've already evaporated any benefit that you would have given, that they would have given from doing that, right? And so it continues to go up. So there's a slight dip in your school M&O property tax here in Texas, but after one year, it would go right back up to where it was before and not even higher. So that's not a good sign for the person that, or a home that had $350,000 valuation, which is the medium value in Texas. Um, this would not be a good thing. I also looked at SB1, which is the raising the homestead exemption by 60,000 plus a 10 cent compression. That would have some better effects. Um, and then HB, and then, and, and then, then you have HB1, sorry, that was Senate Bill 1, HB1 is a 16.2 cent compression, and um, that would have additional benefits as well. And then you have the 25 cent compression, which would be the largest tax cut in Texas history of more of at least $21 billion. That's really what we need right now. And what I show is some charts in here for each one of these cities using that $350,000 home is that yes, SB1, raising the homestead exemption and the 10 cent compression will be close to some of the benefits you'll get from the 25 cent compression for just homesteaders, okay? But the only way you get that rate to really come down closer to zero is by compression. The, the Senate bill just doesn't do that. HB1 will have a greater effect over time to getting as closer to zero. And then they can build on that with future surpluses. This is just from one buy down with the money that's available now. And they have even more money, right? Because they have $33 billion in surplus, at least. There's about $60 billion in extra revenue. So the governor should come in, veto some of this stuff, maybe even veto the budget, but veto some of these budget items so that there's more money for tax relief to get up to 21 billion instead of about the 21 billion dollars or sorry the 12 billion dollars that they're talking about right now um, and so I go through a lot of this. I also talked about how this is would benefit renters, right? Whereas homestead exemptions do not. And then how when renters benefit from that, just through the economics of it, is that they'll pass along that, that lower cost of property taxes to lower rents because of competition and everything else. Um, I got some pushback from that on Twitter. But I mean, that's just simple economics. It's also competition. If I'm one landlord across the street and I have a lower property tax and I have an open unit and nobody's wanting to buy it, well, I'll lower the price. And, and so I get more business. I want to fill up all the units in my property and the other person will have to do the same thing. Yes, it may take a little bit of time because there's a lot of leases and things of that nature, but eventually those prices, those rents will go down and that'll be an economic benefit. And so there's much more benefit with compression compared to homestead exemptions for Texans overall, Texas families are renters, homesteaders, and employers, right? So everyone can get benefits there. And for the economy, as we have more investment, economic growth, and prosperity overall. Um, I even showed, you know, too, that the Texas comptroller said that, you know, um, about half of the school property tax was really what we're talking about here, the school maintenance and operation property tax. 52% is paid for by businesses, at least submitted by businesses. We all pay for it through the form of higher prices, lower, lower wages, and fewer jobs. And then individuals pay about 48%. But then if you look at the breakdown between homeowners and renters, homeowners pay about 50% of that portion, and renters pay 26% when you look at the final incidents, who pairs the ultimate burden. So renters do pay for this. There's a lot of groups that have already been supportive of this. I've been supportive of this as well. I would like to see them do more. I'd like to also see them pass House Bill 5 by Representative Briscoe Kane, which would put a pathway, would put in statute to say you're using surplus dollars, 90% of surplus above population inflation spending to buy down the school middle property tax until it is zero. That would be important as well. So I think there's some good opportunities here to really revive and renew some of the, the bad things, if you will, that happened during the legislative session, during the regular session, here during the special session. There's also some the, the final days of the legislative session in Louisiana. Their budget is a big discussion right now and whether or not they're going to hit their revenue trigger for rainy day fund to allow for franchise tax cuts. There was a bill, Senate Bill 1 by Senator Alon, which basically would allow for a buy down over time of that franchise tax, which is really important. And so I'm hopeful that there will be some more big things happening before that legislative session ends as well. We've seen a lot of good things happen across the country with school choice and other things. And I think this brings me to my final point is, you know, pro 
market policies are good policies that win votes, but more importantly, they help people. And that's why we need more of them at the end of the day. And so that's why I'm going to continue to talk about them each and every day as well in this program and my other program. So I thank you for watching today. Please subscribe, share with your friends and family and everyone else. You know, free market capitalism is the best way to let people prosper, right? And so until next time, have a great day and let people prosper.